Nothing we can do can separate us from God's love for us. And maybe you need to know that. He loves you regardless of your actions, your errors, your mistakes, deliberate or otherwise. You're here because he loves you and he's calling you close. So if that's you, you're here because God wants you to be in his presence. Amen? We have a loving God, don't we? Well, you wonderful people. So what am I going to speak about today? Well, today really this message in its simplicity is about connecting with God. And sometimes to connect with God, it can be appropriate to disconnect from other things, to fully connect with him, to avoid those distractions that often stop us connecting. We can have that with people. We'll be in a conversation with somebody, yet we can be looking at our watch or our dreaded phone or be thinking about something else or waiting to interrupt. And actually, it can stop that connection. So today, in its simplicity, the message is about connection. And that often is achieved through disconnecting with other things. Now, prayer is a great way to connect. Now, I don't know about you. Anyone spend endless times on these AI voicemails? I phone the NHS and I just go, you know, your call is valued. You're valuable to us. 45 minutes later, the phone cuts off. Ever had that? (laughs) With your gas or your electric or your phone insurance, if you want to buy something, they'll pick up in a millisecond. If you want to do something else, it will probably take you 45 minutes. And I was thinking about God, prayer, connection. And, and, you know, God maybe was tempted to install voicemail in heaven. (laughs) Do you know, because it's just got to be bombarded with all of us. uh, And I thought, what would it be like? Imagine praying and hearing the following. Thank you for calling the heavenly helpline. Please select one of the following options. (laughs) Press one for requests. Press two for thanksgiving. Press three for complaints. Press four for all other inquiries. I'm sorry, but all our angels are currently busy dealing with sinners just like you. However, your prayer is important to us, as are you, and we will answer as soon as we can, so please stay on the line. If you'd like to speak to God, press one. If you'd like to speak to Jesus, press two. If you'd like to speak to the Holy Spirit, press three. In the meantime, if you'd like King David to sing you a psalm while you wait, (laughs) press four. To find a loved one who's been assigned to heaven, press five, then enter his or her national insurance number, (laughs) followed by the pound sign. If you receive a negative response, just hang up and try again later. For reservations for heaven, please quote reference J-O-H-N, followed by the numbers... 316. For answers to life snagging questions about dinosaurs, the age of the earth, the purpose of wasps, life on other planets, where Noah's Ark is, please wait until you arrive. (laughs) Apologies, but the office is now closed. (laughs) Due to it being a weekend and a religious holiday. But Please pray again after Monday at 9.30 a.m. But if you are calling out of hours and it is emergency assistance you need, please feel free to call your local pastor at any time, day or night. They would love to hear from you. Thank you and have a heavenly day. Our daily lives, amen, eh? (laughs) So prayer, that is one amazing way we connect with God. And that's a nice link into what I'm going to speak about because I'm going to continue this series on Jonah. And this is part three. We stopped it before Easter and we're picking it up again. Uh, Part two was back on the 3rd of March and you can catch up with that on YouTube. And before that, part one was 18th of Feb for those of you that maybe missed them. But Jonah, when we joined him last time, was praying to God, and he didn't get voicemail. Amen for that? God hears our prayers. And he was praying from the belly of a great big fish fish or a a leviathan of the deep, if you want to sound more dramatic, or a whale, whatever it is. But three days later, the fish opens its mouth and spits Jonah onto dry land in response to his prayer to the Lord. Now remember, God had asked him to go to Nineveh to speak to Nineveh for them to repent, and Jonah had run the other way. But now he's back on track. So he's making his way to Nineveh. He's standing at the gates of Nineveh, a large city, a significant city, 
And now he's ready to deliver God's message to the people of Nineveh. So we're going to pick it up in Jonah chapter 3, starting at verse 1. So it says this, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. And Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed. And all of them, for the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose himself from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the degree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe God will relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. And what a wonderful example, whatever wrong we've done, when we come to God, he offers that forgiveness. Isn't that amazing? All the things the Ninevites had done. So Jonah delivers this message from God and Nineveh repents. And there's an interesting difference here. Regret is when we say, I'm sorry. And you maybe are really sorry, but not enough to actually make a change. Repentance is when you're really sorry. Sorry enough that you want to turn around and say enough is enough and make a change in your life. And that's what they do. They repent. That sitting in the dust, sackcloth over them to say, Lord, we repent. We want to turn around. So they repent and a fast is declared. Even the king makes a decree for everyone to call on God, to give up their evil ways and to give up their violence. And it's interesting. They do two things. They fast and they pray. They fast and they pray. Now, when I prepare sermons, there's certain topics and messages that you know are just going to get a reaction. You know they're going to get amens and there's going to be emotion. You can get great illustrations. Fasting, for example, isn't one that most pastors go, excellent, I'm really going to stir them up today, gosh. But the reason this is mentioned is fasting and praying. The combination of the both of them is powerful and significant and important for us to grasp as Christians. In fact, Jesus himself, you know, he remembers the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. He teaches us how to pray. But in the very same chapter, he goes on and mentions fasting. He says, this is how you should pray. But by the way, he then moves on to the need to fast. Now, most people will read the Lord's Prayer, being happy to pray, happy to ask for things from God, but neglect the fasting bit, which is being willing to go without things for God. And in fact, Jesus himself in Matthew 6, Matthew 6, 16 says, when you fast. He doesn't say if you fast, when you fast. In other words, as my followers, you will pray and you will fast. Now, Jesus, so, so, of course, we know pray, don't we? But when he was baptized with the Holy Spirit by John, he was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit and he prayed and he fasted. And what was the result? He overcame the devil. He overcame the evil plans. There's evidence that prayer and fasting works. And to be an effective disciple or follower or a better word is apprentice of Jesus. If you want to achieve what Jesus achieves, you've got to do what Jesus does. Amen? Now, if I ask for a show of hands, which I won't, how many of you pray? Um, I would imagine most of you, even people that aren't Christians, would probably put their hand up. If I said, how many of you fast, I imagine the number would be far less. Do you agree? I'm not going to embarrass anyone. So anyway, it's interesting. We pray, but we don't necessarily see fasting as of equivalence. Now, the ancient practice of fasting is a natural way to express our faith in our whole being. 
physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. If you think of body, soul, spirit, all of it connected with God. It's mentioned in both the Old Testament, the time before Christ came, and of course the New Testament after he'd come. Multiple incidences of fasting and praying. The Israelites fasted and prayed, praise, confession after sinning against God in Nehemiah chapter 9. And the result? God welcomed them back into his arms. Esther, you know Esther? Esther fasts and prays with Israel. She asked God for the strength to face the king, to overcome that plot of Haman, to genocide of the Jewish nation. And it says, what happens as a result? She has the courage to face the king. He doesn't take her life and Israel is delivered. It works. The mighty King David, ever struggled with forgiveness, ever struggled with loving your enemies? Is it difficult? David thought it was. He prayed and fasted for his enemies in Psalm 35. The result, he responded in a godly way, even when they didn't, showing the world that he was a man after God's own heart. Daniel. All of you know Daniel, Daniel the lion's den. Mighty Daniel fasts and prays to lament Israel's disobedience while they're exiled in Babylon. He asks God to have mercy on his people. What happens in Daniel 9? The result, God hears Daniel's pleas and sends an angel to prophesy to Daniel. Then there's a wonderful prophet, Anna. I want to meet Anna in glory. Fasted and prayed regularly for God's people. Then she prophesied to Mary and Joseph about Jesus in Luke 2. And then she gets to meet the Lord herself. The one she'd prayed and prophesied about, she saw God's one and only son. What an amazing blessing. All that prayer and fasting paid off. Paul and Barnabas. Jeanette mentioned at the beginning, choosing elders, a difficult thing. They recognized to choose leaders in church is tough. So they prayed and they fasted in Acts 14. And what happened? God guided them to choose the right people for the job. And then there's Nineveh. We see them today focusing on that repentance after all the sin they've done. Prayer and fasting. And what happens? God hears. God spares. God forgives. Amen. So prayer and fasting works. Turn to the person next to you and go, I didn't know this, but it works. If it says it in the Bible, it must work. Amen? But don't just believe the word of God. The BBC agree. Turn to the person next to you and go, what? You can trust the BBC, can't you? (laughs) Don't go there, Ryan. Don't go there. The BBC have said this, it can influence, this is fasting, influence your metabolism, help with weight management, support blood sugar levels, improve gut health, support heart health, help prevent diseases, help delay aging, and support circadian rhythm. We all need support with circadian rhythm, don't we? (laughs) All, I mean, it's there. It aids brain health and helps reduce anxiety. The physical, emotional, physiological impact of fasting. There we go, there's other benefits. Anyone struggle with saving or spending too much? Don't put your hand up. <laughs> Just people will look at you and uh, be praying for you later. But if you, if you saved five pounds from one meal, obviously not those of you who shop at Waitrose, but if you spend five pounds <laughs> on just one meal and you struggle to save, five pounds once a week is 20 pound a month, which is 240 pound a year. Come Christmas, there's 240 pound in your bank that wasn't there beforehand. Or if you say, I want to be giving to you, God, I want to be giving to your church, that money you could be giving each month to God's church and his work here. There we go. If you want help with tithing or giving to God, there's another way. Some of you, obviously maybe no one here live, has takeaways. I've heard that some people will spend 25 to 30 pounds on a takeaway. If you fasted from a takeaway once a month, 360 pound a year if you spent 30 pound on a takeaway or you could give that money to the work of the Lord. So it helps with spending, it helps with saving. And the reason I'm saying that is it yields results. Whenever God tells us to do something, it isn't an arbitrary thing. I'm just doing it to make your life really miserable. Everyone else is going to have fun and you're not. It's because God knows when he says us to do something, it blesses us. And far too often, I meet so many people, the problems we have in life is you're often far too connected to your physical desires, far too connected to the world, and far too disconnected 
from the spiritual and with God. Now, prayer connects us with God. It's a spiritual discipline. But fasting disconnects us from the world, the physical distractions, the physical desires. It's about saying, I'm parking that. In other words, Lord, I want to grab hold of you with both hands. Be fully focused on you. It's about focusing with the Lord to say, I can overcome those physical desires, those physical temptations. Those things that can consume us, that can control us, that can cause us to make all kinds of decisions. God says, I want you to enjoy life to the full, but I want you to have control over those things. I don't want them to control you. Amen? Now, of course, we can struggle with sins, can't we? Temptation, things that we know we act and we feel things we shouldn't. Fasting and praying helps with that. But other times it's fears, concerns, facing life generally. Often the thing that you fear the most is where you trust God the least. And that time of connection with God to say, I'm struggling with this, bringing it into his presence. Equally, even good things can get in the way. You know that? Some of our hobbies can get in the way. If your hobby is out of balance, too much time, too much money, it can damage relationships. It can damage your bank account, damage friendships if you're doing it too much. Even exercise, if you overdo it, you know you'll get injury. A lot of things in life, it's about balance. And prayer and fasting is about bringing balance and equilibrium into our lives. So prayer and fasting connects us with God and enables us to have mastery over physical desires through spiritual connection. Amen? With me so far? I'm just feeding a physical desire. Mm. Water, we love it, don't we? Now, it's an important thing to say. It's not a formula here. If I withhold food from myself, God has to answer my prayer. It's not about a formula. It's about a relationship. But fasting demonstrates, you know what? I can overcome this physical desire. I can overcome this. It's going to God and say, Lord, help me to overcome those things physically that I struggle with. I can overcome them through you. It shows you to God that you're saying, God, I rely on you for food and finances and friends and family. Everything else is from you. By fasting, you're saying, God, I'm demonstrating. I want my life to be shaped more by the spiritual things, the priorities of God, than the natural things, the priorities of the world or the physical senses. You're saying, I want it to be shaped more by you, God, than these physical desires that keep tripping me up and getting me in trouble. Jesus says in Matthew 4, verse 4, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, he's saying, you guys are great at feeding your physical senses. I don't need to train you in that. But you're not feeding the other. You've got it out of balance. You need both equally. It's saying, God, every time I could be eating a meal, I'm going to be praying. And I'm going to be praising you. I'm going to be reading your word. I'm going to be listening to a sermon on YouTube. I'm going to be meditating on your direction for my life. Lord, I've got to make some decisions. And I want to make those decisions based on your guidance. Not on every other voice and all the other feelings I have, but on you. And an important thing. Don't say, well, I'm going to fast from food, but then chuck Netflix on and stick on your phone and everything else. What's the point of that? The point is the reason you're disconnecting from the food is to say, I want to focus on you. It's about turning off the TV. Shock, horror, teenagers block your ears now. It's about turning off your phone. Letting your phone go to answer phone. Turn off notifications, stick it in another room. Give it to your brother or sister and say, I'm in a fast from my phone. They won't give it back to you. They'll delight in locking the door and not giving your phone back if you can't resist it. Now, I know for some of you, medically, you can't fast from food, but you can fast from TV. You can fast from phones. You can fast from other distractions and say, this is a quiet time when I need to connect with God. I wonder, do you connect with your phone more than you connect with God? Who is your wisdom guider? Is it the God of Google or is it the God of creation? I didn't even write that down. That's not bad, is it? (laughs) That's not bad. (laughs) Rather than gluing your eyes on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook, it's gluing your eyes on his book. It's time with the Lord saying, those books can wait, but I'm gluing them to you. Set aside time to focus on God. Talk to him about your fears, your needs, your children, your dreams. Google's exhausted by you asking endless questions about everything. Well, give Google a bit of a holiday. And actually say to God, I want to ask you, God, about some things. I want to hear what you have to say. I need you to shape me in the decisions I'm about to make. 
uninterrupted, unplugging, so I can plug in to God. It's about recognizing your need for spiritual feeding, spiritual direction, not just physical feeding, as Jesus says. I wonder if we did an audit of your life, your time, your finances, your priorities. What would it say about you? What would it say about you as a person if an audit was done, how you spend your time, your money, your conversations? What would it say about you or about me? Would it be a life shaped more by God or a life shaped more by our physical desires and feelings and emotions and materialism? Those things that very often can get us into trouble, can't they? Let's face it. As it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, May God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole. In other words, complete. Put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. The one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he will do it. If he says it, he will do it. You can rely on him. It references, doesn't it, body, soul, spirit. Now, I know some of the theologians you'll be debating about Greek thinking about body, soul, and spirit, and Judeo-Christian thinking, but the bottom line is it's a very good way to think of how we are made up, how we connect with the world and with God, and how we develop and grow in our relationship. Our spirit can be seen as the spirit within us connecting with God, enabling us to worship him, to be in relationship with him. You could think of your soul as your emotions, your thoughts, your character. It makes you conscious of your very being. And then your body, that physical environment. Your body is how you connect, the vehicle you connect with in your physical environment. Now, if you think of your soul or your character or your emotions or your thoughts, who you are, it can be fed or shaped by physical desires, can't it? Physical desires or spiritual Now, as we said, you need bread to eat, but you need spiritual food. And often we are far more led by one, which is why we see the world in the mess. And actually, you can see your character being pulled in two directions, and it's a question of balance, to be shaped by both equally. So when you pray and you fast at times, you're saying, I'm disconnecting from the world. I don't think we have a problem disconnecting with God. I could show a show of hands. I'm sure no one would put their hand out. Lord, I've, I, I'm really struggling today to disconnect from all the spiritual things and just feed myself and spend money. We don't need training in that, do we? It's incredibly easy. But actually, often it takes that work, doesn't it, to say, Lord, I want to disconnect from that stuff to connect with you spiritually. It's about that disconnection to connect with him. And you know what? When we do spend time in the Lord's presence, it's amazing when you go back to the physical environment when you've been shaped by the spiritual environment, how you treat people differently. You send different emails. You spend money differently. You speak differently. You spend differently. Other aspects of your life in the physical world are different because you've been in a spiritual environment. So it makes your physical world better anyway. You'll be a better parent, a better co-worker, a better brother or sister, a better friend when you've spent time in God's presence. Amen? So drawing this together is not about some special model for fasting. You can say, I'm going to fast for one meal. And by not eating at that meal, I'm going to spend that time just connecting with God's presence. Unplug everything else and say, Lord, I just want to be with you. I want to be fed by you, influenced by you. For some of you, I know medically, maybe fasting is a difficult thing, blood sugar levels or other things. But then you can still say, I'm going to fast today. The phone is off. The TV's off this evening. All the other input is off. I'm going to read a Christian book. I'm going to pray. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to spend time with my spouse, just together, talking about the week. What's happened? Where are you at? What's good? What's bad? Let's pray together. Let's turn everything else off and lift this together as a couple to the Lord. Disconnect from all the other distractions just to connect with him because we both need him. In its essence, it's very practical. It's saying I'm going to stop those distractions, those things that physically will distract me, cause my eye to glance, and just spend time in your presence. Amen? It has a positive impact on you, on your relationships in a variety of ways. 
You know what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 18? I love this. He says, as we fast without making a show of it, basically, don't go shouting from the rooftops, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. But he says, your father who seeks what is done in secret will reward you. Can I say something? The rewards you have for yourself are insignificant to the rewards Jesus Christ gives you. In all those illustrations I gave, the people were rewarded for that prayer and fast, and he'll do it with you. His rewards are far better than any you can seek from yourself. Jesus prayed and fasted, so we're called to, to be a blessing to others as well as bless ourselves. All those examples I gave through prayer and fasting, we see God answer prayers. And Nineveh, a nation who'd done so much wrong, and maybe you feel like Nineveh, you've done so much wrong. When they prayed and they fasted, God spared and forgave them. So just pause for a moment. What is the Lord saying to you? Just pause in the quiet. He's asking you to come to his throne, to connect with him. Just listen to him now. Just approach him in this quiet moment. Thank you that you have called us here today. You call us because you want to connect with us. And so often there's so many reasons, Lord, why we don't connect. We can feel tired. We can be distracted. And Lord, it's easy just to feed our physical desires and forget that you are there wanting to connect with us, Lord. May each of us know that you're whispering. There's no barrier to coming to you. Nothing we can do wrong that stops us coming into your presence. You want us to connect with you, to heal us, every part of our being. Lord, may we know we're invited into your presence in an unhurried, in an intimate, in a personal way. You are the one that knows every hair on our head. You are the one that looked upon us before we were even born. You are the one that named us before the foundations of the world. You know us intimately. And you say, come, son, come, daughter, come into my presence. Leave the other distractions behind and just rest in my presence. Help us, Lord, to disconnect, to connect with you. And, Lord, then when we enter our physical environments, all the noise, all the busyness, all the pressures, may we do so having been shaped by time with you. Uh, Lord, shape us in our time with you so we can be more of a blessing in our physical environment and be more at peace in ourselves as well. Help us to keep that balance, Lord, recognizing we need physical food, but we need spiritual food too, Lord. Help us to keep in balance, Lord. In your precious name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask David and Rosa to come up and lead us in worship. So if you think that was a tough one, you know what part four's on? Next week, forgiveness. Yeah, be here for that too.
close another song and then Jeanette's going to close in prayer. But in that song, it speaks of resurrection. That, you know, Jesus was connected to a tomb, but that was broken, that connection, and he rose again. And, uh, and maybe some of you here, you know that you are connected to something that is hurting you. Maybe it's physical pain, that connection to pain. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's addiction. Maybe it's out of control spending. But something you think, this has control over me more than I over it. And today God says, I want to set you free. Set you free from the pain. He says, let go in this song. You don't have to speak any special words. Just connect with his presence and let go. Embrace him with both arms. He's going to bring a healing. Whatever it is for you, he says, I want to break that connection, that binding, and set you free. Connect with me in cease and just experience healing in this song. The Lord wants to set you free. Amen.
Thank you, Rosie and David, for <clears throat> leading us so beautifully in worship. He is worthy of all things, and he deserves the glory. Thank you, Val, too. I think there were some problems with the AV, which you sorted, so thank you for that, too, this morning. And um, I was just reminded during um, Ryan's sermon that um, John and I used to fast every Wednesday lunchtime, just one meal a week, and we used to pray for the church. And I haven't done that for years. So um, it was a really good reminder to me uh, that it's all about connection. And it's not about twisting God's arm, but it's, it's all about connection. And with that connection comes the strength and the peace. It doesn't come from watching Netflix. I've tried it. Um, <laughs> it comes from connecting with God. So thank you, Ryan, for that word too. Lord, we just pray that you will help us to make you the one main thing in our life. That there are so many distractions in today's world, but Lord, you are worthy and you deserve the glory. So help us to set aside that time to fast and to pray and to draw on the strength and the peace that only you can give. Amen. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> There's coffee and don't forget about your children. <laughs>